Hi everyone and welcome to the first WISA public webinar entitled Lessons in Co-Production of Climate Services from African Case Studies. My name is Karin Maris and I am a Communications Officer at South South North. I'll be covering the general housekeeping for this webinar. Our panelists today will be presenting a series of presentations of no more than 10 minutes each and our facilitator Suzanne Carter will be keeping them to time very strictly. We'll only be exchanging questions and answers after all presentations have been made. Attendees are asked to submit questions via the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface. Please note the particular panelists to whom you'd like to address the question. As a facilitator, Suzanne will screen the questions and relay them verbally to all the panelists. We'll aim to answer as many questions as possible in the allotted time, and any questions we can't answer live, we will answer in writing following the event. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared on the WISER YouTube channel um, in the coming week. So please consider sharing it with anyone you may know and would like to view it but couldn't attend today. We will be notifying attendees once the webinar and presentations are available online. I now hand over to Suzanne, who will introduce the presenters to you. Thanks very much, Karen. And hello to all our attendees. My name is Suzanne Carter, and I'll be your host today. I head up the Climate Services Practice Area at South South North, and I'm involved in both the Weather and Climate Services for Africa, or WISER program, and also the Future Climate for Africa program, FCFA. And both of these programs are being featured in today's webinar. The webinar will consist of two framing presentations, which will be followed by four case studies. So here's a, an overview of what we'll be covering today. First off, we'll have um, Anna Stainall from the Climate System Analysis Group at the University of Cape Town. She'll present a spectrum of co-production approaches. That will be followed by a presentation on the six building blocks of co-production by Catherine Vincent from Kalima Integrated Development Solutions. And then we'll go into a slightly different mode where we get some feedback from some real life examples of four different projects. Uh, the first will be Joseph Mutemi giving us uh, some feedback about the IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Centers Strengthening Climate Information Partnerships East Africa or SCAPIA project, which was completed last year under the WISER program. Uh, that will be followed by Katinka Voigtsetter, who will be giving us a, a bit more from the Climate Systems Analysis Group about uh, the, the findings of effective working with cities uh, in Southern African cities uh, from the Future Resilience of African Climate and Lands or Fractal Program, which is one of the Future Climate for Africa programs. Uh, this will be followed by Tufa Dinku from the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at Columbia University. And he'll share some learnings from the Enhancing National Climate Services or ENACTS program on their work in Tanzania to help tackle malaria. And lastly, we have Emma Fisman from King's College and VNG Consulting, and she'll share some thoughts on a range of tools that they've used in the AMA 2050 project, also a part of Future Climate for Africa. I will just give you a very quick overview of the program that uh, is sort of hosting this webinar, which is the Transform project. It's one of, of several WISER projects uh, in the phase two of WISER. And the purpose of this project has been to create learning and sh a sharing environment about uh, co-production approaches in particular, which is what today's webinar is about, but other uh, drivers of user uptake of weather and climate information as well. Uh, and also looking at some of the reasons why socioeconomic benefits of these climate services can prove greater value of, of investing in weather and climate services. Some of the key stats about our project, um, as I mentioned, one of the key expected outputs is to enhance understanding and capacity within the WISER program. Um, and th that is focused on those three points I mentioned already, co-production, uh, demand and uptake, and um, looking at that at both national, sub-national community levels. Uh, so today's case studies uh, are very much in, in, in line with that. Uh, we also provide some support for monitoring and evaluation and learning. The delivery partners for the Transform project are South South North, the Climate System Analysis Group, the Overseas Development Institute, ICF, and the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. So some of the speakers today are from these various organizations. 
And just to give you a heads up that under this project, uh, the Transform project, we will be finalizing a co-production manual drawing on examples from across Africa that provide practical guidance, lessons learned and how to information about how to go about co-production. Uh, this is a joint publication that we're doing with the Future Climate for Africa program and this manual will be available in both a digital book format and a print format in October 2019. So this webinar is sort of a sneak peek of that manual and we'll be providing some early overview of those key aspects of that manual. So quickly just to remind you of the overview of the presentation and what the uh, following speakers will be covering will be the spectrum of co-production approaches, the six building blocks of co-production and four case studies. I'd now like to hand over to Anna Stainel from Climate System Analysis Group. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so essentially, I have the, the task now of kicking off um, why would we even want to co-produce? Um, this is, I guess, a, a somewhat preaching to the converted if you're already on this webinar. Um, but we, what we really wanted to stress here is that co-production is very much a bi-directional benefit. So it's not just about producing information that is uh, useful for decision making, but it's also about improving the producer's understanding of the decision context. So there's a huge amount of benefits to be had from the producer's side in really understanding the decision context that they're producing information for um, and getting a much better understanding of, of what would be useful from the research environment in producing information that's decision relevant. Um, so I wanted to put that up front because I think that's often underestimated the benefit to the producers. Um, Co-production also helps in providing information that responds to the needs of the users. Um, obviously, if you're speaking to, um, to the practitioners or the people who are going to be using the information, um, you get a much better sense of, of what's actually needed. Um, and then the information that's required can be, hopefully, can be provided for that use. Um, a an un better understanding of the decision context also helps to improve the audience specific communication. So how would you communicate um, your information so that it actually makes sense to the audience you're communicating it to, um, so that it's relevant and so that it's effective for use. Um, so that uh, it, you can make sure that um, you're feeding it, into, feeding it into the decision context in a way that is useful and understandable. Um, Co-production also builds capacity both ways in using climate information products. So it builds capacities um, for the practitioners using it, but also for the producers developing the information. Um, it promotes joint ownership of the products. Um, so that it's not just uh, an information product that's being fed into the decision space, but it's a, it's a product that is being co-developed and um, co-generated by both practitioners, users, researchers, producers, everybody involved in the process. So that it really provide, it, it includes knowledge from all the, the relevant parties um, in the process. And finally, co-production tends to lead to a wider reach and impact of the products because um, people use the products more if they've had an input in developing um, the product. Uh, next slide, please. So um, essentially, co-production creates this virtuous cycle. Um, so if you produce more relevant information um, and more user-focused communications, this leads to better understanding use and use and benefits of the information, which in turn builds resilience in livelihoods and economic development, um, which in turn increases the demand for climate services and then you need to develop more relevant products and then the cycle goes around again. So co-production really is a beneficial process and um, creates this, this beneficial cycle that um, is very much worthwhile and essential to effective uptake of, of climate information. Next slide, please. So what we've gathered through this project is um, we've pulled together a number of, of different examples of co-production. Um, and through all these examples, what we've realized is that there is a spectrum of co-production um, through from what we term as consultative to immersive. So consultative co-production um, revolves more around the kind of predefined processes that um, involve the input from users 
Um, but these are more static consultation processes. So the, um, the project has been predefined, the product may be predefined, and the co-production process is about tailoring that product or nuancing it so that it's effective for the user need. On the other end of the spectrum um, is what's called immersive, what we've called immersive co-production which is really a very, um, it's really putting yourself into what we describe as the third space, um, which is opening yourself up to, um, to what emerges through the process. So it's going in with very little agenda of what's gonna come out of the process, um, allowing it to be an iterative process that is very flexible. So um, what emerges from the co-production isn't predefined at the outset. Um, so I'm going to provide a couple of case studies just to show you what the difference in this spectrum might look like. So um, firstly, on the consultative end of the spectrum, can you bring up a little circle, please? So um, this is a case study that falls along the consultative end of the spectrum um, that we present in the guidance. Next slide, please. So through the BRACED program, um, there was a write shop held uh, which was used to develop case studies on promoting gender equality. Um, and this we've placed down the consultative end of the spectrum because the BRACE Knowledge Manager is, um, essentially conceptualized this process and um, the actors involved. Um, it was a very, it was a once-off process. It resulted in a one-week write shop where um, consortium NGOs from the different consortiums under the BRACE program were brought together to share experiences of how they had incorporated gender into their, um, into their programming. Um, so it resulted in four co-produced case studies um, that were very much a, a blend of knowledge across the different consortia. Um, so it did result in a, in a co-produced product, but the, the, um, the, the aim of that product was very much predefined by the knowledge manager from the start. So there, was, there wasn't a lot of scope for changing what the product would be, um, but it was a very useful co-produced product in the end um, and just a one-off interaction. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna just show you a quick example of what you might think of as co-production on more of the immersive end of the spectrum. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to use the example of the Future Resilience for African Cities and Lands project, which um, fell under the, the uh, Future Climate for Africa program. Um, the Fractal project was a, a four-year project, um, and it had a large budget, budget and many partners. Um, and what the intention of the project was, was to integrate scientific knowledge into climate sensitive decisions at the city regional scale. So the, the project focused on six Southern African cities um, and used a, a very flexible and emergent approach to understanding what the issues were in each of the cities. Um, so uh, one technique for doing this was through um, embedded researchers. Um, embedded researchers were positioned in each of the cities for the duration of the project and they acted as conduits between the cities and the research team. Um, but importantly, uh, the, the difference with the fractal project was that um, the, the, uh, the burning issues in each of the cities emerged through the process. So a lot of time was put in initially in the project in developing relationships in the cities, um, really trying to understand the decision context and what the, the burning issues and needs were within each of the cities um, that would then result in the research and the products that would help the cities to adapt to the changing climate. Um, but as I said, this, is, this was a big project and it had many partners um, and it had a, a flexible funding process that allowed, um, allowed the, the part, project partners to work through this very much flexible and emergent process. Next slide, please. So what we want to get across is there really is no right or wrong with the type of co-production that you undertake. Um, your chosen form of co-production is, is influenced by factors like the local context, so what's actually required for that context, who's involved in the co-production, 
Um, the purpose of the work, so whether, you're, whether you are really trying to nuance a product or whether you're trying to develop a new product that um, emerges from the decision context. Um, and then the constraints of funding and what money is available to undertake this co-production. But often there is a unique blend that emerges um, within the process. So it's very, it, it's very seldom that you find a project that only undertakes one type of co-production, so only undertakes the consultative or only undertakes the immersive. There's often a blend along the spectrum of some parts of the process may be more consultative and that's appropriate and some parts of the process may be more immersive and that's appropriate. Um, so this, this mix of co-production types is often appropriate. Um, so this is important to bear in mind as Catherine and Vincent takes you through the building blocks um, in that if you, it, where, where on the spectrum you're positioning your co-production may mean that you dip into each of the building blocks to more or less extent. Um, but it, there's, no, there's no right or wrong to this process, but what, it, what is important is to consider each of these building blocks along the way. So I'm going to hand you over to Catherine Vincent to take you through the building blocks. Thanks, Anna. So we've identified six in the co-production process, um, and they broadly relate to the project cycle. And as Anna said, co-production can be done in all of the building blocks or some of them, depending on um, what the problem is that's being addressed. And again, as Anna said, the nature of the co-production that's undertaken in each building block can also vary. Could be consultative, could be immersive, could be somewhere in between. Again, depending on the context um, and the preferences of, of the actors that are involved. Next slide, please. So one building block, um, which typically comes at the, at the start of the process um, and is really important for co-production is to identify key actors and build partnerships among those key actors. Particularly at the outset of the co-production process, it's essential to ensure that all the relevant parties are included, um, and that's likely to involve um, people that, that fall under, under different, different categories. So producers of climate information, users of climate information, um, and then intermediaries who play a role in communicating between producers and users and also packaging information accordingly. The risk is that if, uh, if we fail to identify uh, and include any of the relevant parties, then that could undermine the validity of the co-production process later on and could also risk going off on a tangent and co-producing a climate service which is not best suited to, um, to the need. Next slide, please. So having identified those key actors and started to build partnerships, it's also important um, to look at the different perspectives and priorities of those various partners um, in order to build common ground and to come to consensus on how to work throughout the process. Um, and that, this could sometimes require capacity development um, of some of the different parties, um, basically so that everyone is able to feel that they're respected as equals in the process regardless of their, their background or their, uh, or their knowledge basis. For example, you may have parties who have scientific knowledge, you may have others who have um, very contextual local knowledge, but in co-producing a climate service, both forms of knowledge are equally valid. And also since co-production is bringing together parties with different perspectives and different ways of working, uh, possibly who've never collaborated before in the past. It's also important in the stage of building common ground to look at the different expectations um, and to build trusting relationships that can be effective later on. It may be the case that assumptions that are common within one group, for example, wouldn't necessarily hold with others. So um, often in co-production of climate services, for example, we find uh, researchers who are involved in the process are particularly interested in producing academic papers because that's their currency but the incentive structure for progression of um, staff in a met agency for example is is unlikely to to be the same so understanding all these all these different um, priorities and, and what different parties want to get out of the process early on will um, will make for a smoother co-production um, process and a more effective co-produced climate service 
And this stage of building common ground um, typically requires face-to-face -face contact and, uh, and plenty of dialogue. And it's important not to underestimate the time that's necessary for, for this to, to happen. If you want to spend time exploring different aims, perspectives, expectations and ways of working, um, having face-to-face -face contact and, and meetings and really building up trust is, uh, is, is re very important. Next slide, please. So having built necessary relationships and laid the foundation for effective working partnerships, um, various parties working together in the co-production process can, um, can come together to co-explore the particular need. So this process of co-exploration allows for developing a shared understanding of the decision context in order to better be able to develop a climate service that is useful and usable. And for effective co-exploration um, of the need, again, it's important to create a space that allows for um, free flow of ideas and learning and understanding. Again, bearing in mind that there are different parties with different perspectives um, and kind of ensuring that that open space is not influenced by biases from, from any of the, the different parties is important because that's uh, going to create an environment which allows issues to emerge organically um, and so they can be prioritised for further action. Next slide, please. So once the, the specific need has been agreed and identified, um, then the next building block is around co-developing potential solutions that can address that need. So the output here is going to be something that's agreed upon that provides a better way of addressing the identified need than what currently exists or previously existed. In some cases, it could be the generation of a new forecast product or advisory. In other cases, it could be a modified process that makes available existing information um, to be communicated um, to a bigger and more inclusive audience. Co-developing a solution is unlikely to be a simple linear process. It's more likely to be interactive um, and iterative with many discussions and knowledge exchanges required to get from point A to, to point B. So quite a lot of putting an idea forward, trial and error, refining the output accordingly and, and continuing on in, uh, in that manner. So again, um, time and, uh, and space in which to, to do this is going to be important. Next slide, please. So co-delivering the solutions then allows those co-developed products to be effectively packaged and communicated to ensure that they're useful and usable by the target user groups. Now, at this stage, this is often pushing information producers outside of their comfort zone. And there's often quite a big role for intermediaries and knowledge brokers who have skills in communication, um, or who are trusted parties um, who can portray information to, to user groups. So NGOs are an example of an actor that, that can um, play a key role in uh, this building block. The key part here is that the, the parties for whom the product is intended to be useful are able to understand it and have sufficient confidence to, to use it. And for this to happen, they need to trust the information um, and sometimes been trained on the utility and potential limitations of information, which is obviously particularly relevant with regards to weather forecasts and climate projections, which have um, very specific ways of, of being presented, which are not necessarily going to be familiar to, to anyone who hasn't been trained in, in that. Next slide, please. So evaluation is often mentioned last, but um, as I hope is clear from, from having spoken about the, the other building blocks, it's really important to have a proactive approach to reflecting on and monitoring on progress throughout the co-production process. So evaluation is a building block that stands alone, but it also extends across all the other building blocks in the, in the process. Each of the, the co-production building blocks should build in a process of evaluation to ensure um, progress, not just in developing the, the product or the service or the output, but also in uh, evaluating the, the process in which the production is, uh, is embedded. This is particularly important given the wide range of um, parties that are involved and the fact that they're unlikely to have worked together extensively before. 
but also since co-production of climate services is still such a, a nascent area ensuring that we evaluate um, at the end of the process is also really important so that we can identify successes and challenges and ensure that those can be learned, um, learned from going forward. Next slide, please. So those are the building blocks of co-production, identifying actors and building partnerships, building common ground, co-exploring the need, co-developing solutions, co-delivering solutions, and then evaluating. Now, against the backdrop of the building blocks, we've also distilled some principles which are cross-cutting and can kind of inform the manner in which the co-production is carried out. I guess we could say that we can use them as a, a checklist to ensure that the way that we're co-producing climate services is, uh, is adhering to, to good practices. So I won't go into all of these in detail now because uh, we are planning to, to do another webinar that is going to um, elaborate them. But let me just briefly go through um, and touch on them because they, they are obviously relevant. So transparency on forecast, accuracy and certainty. All decisions um, should be context and decision driven. All services should be context and decision driven. Should bear in mind the decision timeframes and the sustainability of, of the process. Building trust, embracing diversity, and that diversity can be in terms of languages, can be in terms of knowledge and value systems, and also institutional practices. Ensuring inclusion, um, particularly taking into account gender and cultural diversity. Ensuring flexibility, both in what is done and in how it's done. Uh, conscious facilitation of the process, ensuring accessible communication, and making sure that the co-production of the climate service is adding value for, for all of those involved. I'll now hand over to my colleagues who will illustrate how some of these building blocks have been used in, uh, in various case study contexts. So, uh, Joseph, over to you first. Hi, Joseph. Um, are you there? You may go ahead. Hi, Joseph. Are you able to? Yes. Yeah, me. Hello, am I on the board now? Uh, ah, yes, you are. Oh, very good. Yeah, and actually started. So yeah, it's um, I was just going to, 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 to start from the point of strengthening partnership uh, in climate information um, services, uh, the service providers. So the Inga Climate Solution Center, um, Nairobi, um, in partnership with the UK Met Office, uh, recognize the, the fact that in producing uh, climate information there is great need to to use effectively the products like the models which are actually run at the global uh, modeling centers which are actually under the auspices of um, the world methodological organization these um, global modeling centers uh, ordinarily they produce um, forecast information all over the globe in form of graphical outputs, typically maps. And if these products, for example, are not post-processed by experts in the regional climate information producing centers like ourselves, benchmarked, and in the context of user application, informing the, 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 the challenges, we do not get far. And this was the strong point and the objective of the CPA project. And the so, excuse me, Joseph. Hi, sorry for interrupting. Um, could you perhaps move closer to your microphone as you will come through very softly? Hello? 
Hi, Joseph. Um, you just your voice is coming through very softly. If you could maybe move closer to your microphone. Now, maybe that's better now. Yes, it's a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, we we in the strengthening strengthening of the partnership in the uh, global producing centers for climate information and also regional climate producing centers like ourselves for Eastern Africa. The, in the context of making more objective use of global model forecast, what we did here is first and foremost to ensure that at the regional center, we have the expertise to be able to use the global model products in terms of benchmarking them with regional data, for example, uh, development of uh, skill matrices, which actually translate into the relevance of these uh, forecasts at regional level for region support in sectors, mainly like uh, food production, uh, sectors like uh, water resources, uh, uh, utilities and the management, for example, hydro point generation. And uh, this en entailed um, development of service delivery teams who actually were like the expert um, team uh, dedicated to carrying out this work in partnership with, the, of course, the, 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 the end user um, organizations, and uh, also using this uh, model product more objectively to inform our um, regional climate outlook forums in the form of the lack of product. Next slide, please. And for this particular um, uh, activity and the uh, uh, proof of concept um, uh, WISA project under the under the, 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 the under under the under the program. Or what we then achieved is that first and foremost, we were able to have uh, a good number of uh, national focal points up to 11 trains, exactly on the actual hands-on science in working with the model product. And also in terms, of, I think you have back, please, back. back yes. And uh, in terms of um, what, what then uh, took place and uh, what output uh, for Eastern Africa and Greater North Africa, our regional climate outlook forums uh, could actually happen in with the lead times of, of almost um, three weeks. It used to happen in almost three times of one week, which then led to this uh, focus being able to at least inform decisions at national and the subnational levels with that uh, with that better lead times and uh, in terms of then what uh, lasted in, in its legacy and therefore transformation is that the trained experts are continuing to to serve to, to use these skills at their national levels at their countries and uh, this is continuing in form of um, better post processing and the use of these uh, new available model data sets, model focus from the global centers to the regional center who is our sales and cascading that to the national to the national levels. There is of course um, a citation of um, um, a recorded in, uh, pro productivity improvement due to early decisions like planning of landing this. Uh, um, uh, reverend uh, uh, Prof, and then we 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 we, we are able to to, to 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 cite that particular uh, good outcome. Of course, it's going to be, need to be um, verified with the uh, more as a scaled uh, yeah, experiments for purposes of informing the regional uh, food security security needs. But uh, we think we achieved quite a lot. Uh, this uh, is continuing within the second phase of the WISA 2 uh, project as support to, to each park and therefore to Eastern Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katinka. I'm from CSAG, the Climate System Analysis Group. I'm going to be talking about the Fractal project that my colleague Anna has already touched on briefly. Uh, Fractal stands for Future Resilience of African Cities and Lands, and it's one of the FCFA Future Climate for Africa programs. 
And hi to all the fractal colleagues that I see are online today. In terms of the bigger purpose of the project, um, what we are aiming to do is to bring together a broad range of stakeholders. So researchers and practitioners in order to co-produce relevant knowledge, uh, in order to support resilient development pathways and to support and enable decision makers to better integrate uh, climate knowledge into their resource management decisions and urban development planning. Next, please. Um, the project focuses on nine Southern African cities. So Cape Town, Etiquini, also known as Durban, uh, Johannesburg, Harare, Gaborone, Blantyre, Lusaka, Vintuk and Maputo. And today I'm going to focus on the last three cities because the processes in those cities have been the most similar. Next, please. So Fractal is a consortia project and here are a number of our consortia partners. Last on the list uh, is the Climate System Analysis Group, CSAG, that's coordinating the project. Uh, but most importantly that I want to highlight here is the university parts of partners of Zambia, Namibia and Eduardo Mondlane in Mozambique. So the university is based in the three cities that we're going to focus on, Lusaka, Maputo and Ventuk. Next, please. So I want to start off by highlighting some of the key infrastructure that I think is project infrastructure that is key to enabling co-production within Fractal. So within th each of the three cities, we have a city project implementer, which is an academic based with the university in the city. So in Lusaka, it's uh, um, an academic at the University of Zambia. Then we also have a city focal point that is with the local government, the local municipality, uh, based within the city department or a city council. So in Lusaka, it's a person within the Lusaka City Council. Then we have an MOU, a memorandum of understanding that is signed between the city university and the city department or city council. Um, and this MOU lays out the kind of foundation for collaboration. Then we've got the embedded researcher and the embedded researcher is contracted by the university, but basically sits between the university and the city. And so reports to both the city PI and the focal point and spends physical time at both the city and the university. Then on the right hand side of the slide, uh, as you can see, there's the transdisciplinary city task teams. So each city has a task team led by the PI, the city PI and the embedded researcher, but including consortia partners from across the various institutions. And then we have the thematic clusters, uh, decision making, city learning, climate information, and the nexus, which includes partners from across the consortia. And so the city task team is uh, tasked with leading the process in each city. And the thematic clusters kind of come in and out of this process, um, depending on what the focus and the timing of events, etc. Next slide, please. So what are the kind of key modalities for co-production in Fractal? Central is the, the learning lab and the dialogues. And these are spaces uh, that bring together a variety of stakeholders to get to know each other and to share and develop knowledge. So while the kind of the learning labs are kind of the key, um, how can you say, pillars, and the main events, the dialogues are smaller and more focused gatherings that happen in between the learning labs as needs arise. And both are convened periodically across the cities, but the frequency varies from city to city, depending on how um, the process in the city evolves. And I see here, it says we've had 12 learning labs to date, and I believe we had a le another learning lab in winter last week, which means I think we are up to 13. Um, then there's the embedded researcher, which I mentioned on the last slide. Um, 
the embedded researcher plays a key role in the task team, the city task team, and in coordinating and organizing the, the learning labs and dialogues. But also, and more importantly, the embedded researcher is a kind of in-between person between the academic space and the practitioner space. And some of the role, part of the role of the, of the embedded researcher is to sensitize either sides of what is happening in the other space. So the academics come into um, the labs with an understanding of what's happening in the city space and vice versa. Next slide, please. And so a little bit more on the nature of the process uh, in each city. Um, so this is not a neatly pre-designed step-by-step process. It's open and it's emergent and it's been at times and still at times is a messy space. But it's a messy space from which we are learning and sharing knowledge. So one thing that is in common across the cities is the, the starting point. So uh, in the first lab in each city, we identified burning issues. So critical challenges facing that specific specific city, as well as research questions linked to this. And so these were identified by the participants at the lab, which included consortia partners and local uh, stakeholders from the city across government, academia and uh, practice. And so from these initial burning issues and the research questions, uh, these kind of provided to various extents a red thread through the following process, but then the focus and the process as well as the timing of the events and the process outputs emerge from there and has emerged differently in each city. So the co-production process has in essence been different from one city to the next and it's therefore difficult to, to, to kind of neatly define the concept for, for the fractal project as a whole and as a whole. And I think importantly noting here that these are only three of the nine cities and that the processes in the other cities have also been somewhat different from these. Then in terms of the, the outputs, um, so fractal is strongly focused on, on the process itself and the learning that happens within it as a key output. And what is more, we also focus strongly on the growing networks and relationships that are built through that, uh, through those processes as an important output. In addition to that, there are the more kind of conventional outputs um, that have been co-produced, co co-delivered, city policy briefs in Lusaka, as well as working papers, journal papers, and for each city, a city-specific climate risk narrative. Next slide, please. So lastly, a few lessons learned from, um, from the Fractal project. And this is just some of the lessons and you can look at our case study in the manual for more detail. First of all, time. So we've learned that there's a need for sufficient time both at the engagement. So in essence, needing more than one day, ideally. Learning labs are now generally two days, at least. Uh, but also a number of consecutive engagements through time. So one or two engagements with the same group of people not being enough. You need to re-engage and re-engage. So potentially at least four labs and two dialogues over the past two, three years in each city. And ideally, of course, this is an ongoing process into, into the future, not just a project confined um, time frame. Uh, in addition to time, there's the continuity of the people engaged. So ideally, you want to work in these labs and dialogues and through the process with the same people, both in terms of from the academic institutions as well as the um, the other uh, government institutions and NGOs. And in order to do that, you need to, you need to convince both the, the managerial level in the institutions and the people themselves that continuity is important. So managers need to, to understand the importance of sending the same person every time. And ideally also the person who is themselves engaging would want to engage and would want to motivate for them being able to go to the events again and again. 
And I think part of how we've been able to motivate for the latter is through facilitation. So ensuring that um, it is a fun process, a process that um, someone would like to stay engaged in where they feel heard and uh, where they learn. And so the facilitation um, process in itself has been key, a key enabler. Um, and so using games, etc., to ensuring that is fun, but also using methods to try and balance hierarchies, to create a safe space where you enable trust, learning and collaboration. Then lastly, um, there's the idea of the third space. So the third space is kind of a hybrid space, a space where individuals of, for example, different disciplinary or professional backgrounds come together. So you could have a social and physical scientist going from their disciplinary home into a common space and trying to work together or an academic and a practitioner coming together in the third space to work together or all of the above. And in essence, we've learned through Fractal that th this is easier said than done. And so when designing the process, you have to be sensitive to the challenges that emerge with, uh, with this. And with that, that's it for me. Thank you everyone for listening and over to my next colleague. Hello, uh, greetings everybody. I'm Tufa from uh, IRI. So I'm going to talk about uh, INACT, uh, malaria surveillance and control uh, support in Tanzania. INACT stands for Enhancing National Climate Services. Uh, it is designed uh, to overcome the challenges of climate data availability, access to and the use of climate information products. It has already been implemented in about 13 countries in Africa and now has started to expand into Asia and South America. Right now I am in Bangladesh uh, implementing INACT. So the INACT process by its nature involves co-production of uh, tools and information product for different user groups. And today um, I will talk about the specific support of INACT for the health uh, sector. So the purpose is actually working with the national MIS service in Tanzania to create uh, relevant climate services for the national uh, malaria program uh, in Tanzania. Uh, this was accomplished through a series of in-country workshops, uh, technical support from IRI to the National uh, Meteorological Service uh, Agency in, in Tanzania uh, and the Minister of Health, specifically the Malaria uh, Control Program and then other uh, partners. Next slide, please. So the key outputs, the first one is uh, an interactive online climate information portal that we call MapRooms, uh, which enables uh, the health um, officers to extract and analyze climate information uh, on the past, present, or the future for any administrative level. Uh, the other output is capacity bio, and interest actually developed in the, mal in the malaria community to understand and use uh, climate information. Uh, also, there is an effort actually to link the, the map room, the climate information portal with the information system uh, from the Ministry of Health. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, 
the key output, the key stats. The first one is because of better understanding of climate information and its value. Now there is a, mu a much more greater interest and engagement uh, from the malaria control community in Tanzania and uh, the wider health community uh, in Tanzania. Uh, the other output is that now that this co-production process has gone beyond the project and beyond IRI's involvement, the malaria control program has been training uh, the health officers from the districts on the use of the climate uh, information uh, product by themselves without involving IRI. The lessons learned. So the lessons learned are not just for the house. I think it is, uh, I can say for uh, any application, any application that's climate information. So the first lesson learned is that you cannot assume that people will understand climate information and they use it because of one workshop, even two, three workshops. As uh, said earlier, it requires constant engagement, uh, not only to teach them, as Anna mentioned in the morning, in the earlier, but also to learn from them so that you can uh, improve uh, and add the products um, based on their uh, feedback and requirements. Uh, the other thing that actually we learn is the fact that uh, just teaching about climate information without actually teaching about climate basics and how climate affects that specific sector might not work. So we are meteorologists, we know we, there are certain phrases that we use and that we assume people understand, be it ENSO, textiles. We found out actually that's not true. So it is good to have a common understanding, I think the basic understanding of the climate jargon and the climate basics, but also high climate information can help impact that specific user or specific sector. And of course, again, this is for everything, uh, we need to link it to the policy engagement because whatever you do at practice level, at planning level, need to be supported uh, all the way at the policy level. Uh, but also this day is in engagement with the policy level uh, here might help actually maybe securing international funding uh, in that specific area. So that's it. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, this is uh, Emma Wisman and thank you for the opportunity to share some learning from West Africa now. Um, greetings to the AMA partners listening. Um, there's a large number of institutions taking part in the AMA 2050 project. Um, but in this case study, we've only really got time to discuss a little bit about the work we've been doing on co-production in Senegal. So the AMA 2050 project, AMA stands for African Monsoon Multidisciplinary Analysis 2050. So if you don't mind, I'll use the um, acronym AMA 2050 is part of the Future Climate for Africa program as well. Um, and it really aims at improving understanding of the West African monsoon, how it will be affected by climate change in the coming decades, and then to use that learning within some specific decision making processes. Um, and the, the project has two pilots. Um, one is focusing on supporting flood resilient urban planning in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso. But in this case study, we're really focusing on the work in Senegal, supporting climate resilient agriculture. So the project has used a, a wide range of approaches for supporting co-production. Um, and as a common framework for the work in both Burkina Faso and Senegal, we've used the participatory impact pathways analysis, another nice long name with a better name of uh, the acronym of PIPA. And PIPA really uh, comprises a series of tools allowing partners to jointly develop pathways to climate informed development. Next slide, please. So um, two approaches that the project AMA 2050 has used 
to support the development of a, a model of farming systems. Um, these are firstly the plateau game, which you'll see on your left, and uh, then the theatre forum, which you'll see on your right. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more about both of those and also about um, participatory modelling. So um, in the plateau game, it's a scenario exercise where, uh, where farmers are provided with a board or plateau, which represents several farmers' fields. And the aim is to discuss ad adaptation options. So farmers choose a number of activities and how they allocate their resources. And the outputs depend on how they allocate those resources but also on uh, the climate. And as you can see, I hope in the picture on the left, there's a climate card, um, a card with squares in white, gray and blue. And this represents the, um, the climate or the weather that's happened in the past rainy season. And in uh, AMA 2050, these cards, the climate on these cards was informed by the climate science that was undertaken within the project. So then we have um, a, 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 another approach called participatory modelling, which I don't have a, an image of here, but this allowed regional decision makers, as in sub-state regional decision makers, and agricultural researchers from the Senegalese Institute for Agricultural Research, which is ISRA, which is coordinating AMA's work in Senegal. So both these sub-regional decision makers and ISRA were able to inform the modelling um, and the outcome from the plateau game and so ensure that the model took into account both farmers' um, farmers' uh, interests and um, thoughts but also the, uh, the, the needs and the issues of regional decision makers and the expertise of agricultural researchers. So from the combination of these different approaches from the participatory modelling and the plateau game um, all these together, the project has um, drawn in a, in a theatre piece um, and is using the theatre forum methodology to share and discuss, promote discussion on learning um, on, about the issues raised. So theatre forum, what is that? Basically, it uh, takes place in a number of steps. I mean, firstly, the partners have to agree a story inspired by real facts and tensions. And when it's actually played, you play it once and people, uh, spectators listen. And then a moderator or joker invites people to discuss the issues raised and to propose possible solutions. And then in a final third part to Theatre Forum, um, the spectators are invited to replace the characters and to try out their solutions. So in real time, the spectators are able to try out their solutions while the other actors remain in character. And so it really provides an opportunity to explore different options for addressing issues. Um, and in Senegal, uh, AMA 2050 has been working with a theatre forum group called Kadu Yara. Um, and Kadu Yara has in, in fact added a further element to the theatre forum methodology um, and here, after the first showing of the, of the play, um, they have a trial where they invite the spectators to judge the, um, the actions of each of the characters and to decide whether to put them uh, in the shadow if they think that they have acted well. If they think they have acted not so well, they leave them in the middle. Um, sorry, if they think they've acted in a neutral way, they leave them in the middle. But if they think they've acted poorly, they can decide to put characters in the sun. So from the basis of um, trialing, it really invites discussion and then leads to um, uh, the spectators proposing different solutions for addressing the tensions. And in fact, these photographs on the right are hot off the press. In the last fortnight, uh, Kadu Yara has been taking AMA um, 2050 uh, play to a number of different audiences and the play has been taken to members of the Senegalese National Assembly, um, also climate scientists partnering in AMA 2050 project, um, agricultural researchers at ISRA, at the um, Senegalese National Research Institute,
then also, as is depicted in these photographs here, also the piece has been played with um, local decision makers in Yaha, and then with farmers and farmer network groups in Kafrin. Next slide, please. So here um, we only have the, the um, institutions, the partners, um, of some of the partners involved in AMA 2050. The co-production work in Senegal has really been led um, by IRD and CIRAD and together coordinated by ISRA um, with international coordination provided by the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, but what has been possible to produce from the range of approaches that we have employed. Firstly, an assessment of the impacts of climate change on agriculture in Senegal. And this was very timely as it was able to inform the ongoing development of the country's national adaptation plans. And then secondly, as I mentioned, we've been using these approaches to um, inform the development of a, a bioeconomic model of farming systems. So the plateau game, um, the board game, mentioned in the previous slide allowed farmers to inform the model and the participatory modeling um, allowed regional decision makers and the ISRA nat national agricultural research expertise to inform the model as well. So really allowing some ongoing co-production but by do using different methodologies with different groups of, of actors. And finally the theatre forum, forum piece has allowed a wide range of um, actors to really engage with dialogue on the issues raised through AMA 2050 and a film is going to be produced of the debates across those different actors and the film's really designed to share the learning that can emerge from employing the theatre forum approach. Next slide please. So what's some key learning from AMA 2050? As I hope's clear, even in the short presentation, it's really a combination of approaches that has allowed us to explore different adaptation options. So by using different kinds of co-production, we've been able to engage with different levels of decision-making and so support decision-making at both the national level and decentralized levels. Um, and, and, and then in that way, supporting adaptation and agricultural planning in Senegal and city and national flood risk management in Burkina Faso. And I think the experience from AMA 2050 and as is reiterated from previous presentations, the things that are really important from the learning in, in undertaking co-production, there's no one size fits all. I mean, it's not off the shelf co-production. This is the standard way of doing it. We really need to tailor the co-production to the specific context. And each step in the, in the process of co-production, the building blocks that were mentioned earlier, maybe we need different kinds of co-production at each stage and with different um, levels of engagement between the actors involved. And then in terms of building capacities for co-production, um, and I noticed that there was a, a question, one of the questions already raised by participants, but by a participant in this webinar was on the issue of sustainability. It's very nice doing co-production, but when it's um, dependent on a project, how are we going to make sure it's sustainable? So in AMA 2050, we've been really been trying to build capacities for co-production within partnering institutions and existing networks, rather than relying on external intermediaries or knowledge brokers, we're really trying to ensure that we have sustainable capacities for co-production and that these can endure after the end of the AMA 2050 project. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, again raised earlier, we need to be sure that everybody gets something out of taking part in co-production. And clearly, there are, um, people have differing uh, impact or benefit requirements, um, and we need to be really explicit from the outset of doing co-production um, what these differing impact or benefit requirements are. For example, uh, people uh, living um, at risk of flood might need to have their, their more immediate needs addressed, while partnering scientists want to um, develop uh, peer-reviewed articles. And if we think about it carefully from the outset, 
there may be ways that we can ensure that everybody gets something of benefit for them um, directly and so ensure that people are all willing to invest in the time it requires to undertake co-production. Thanks very much and I'm handing back now to Suzanne. Thanks very much to all of our uh, discussants today. This has been a, a really good, rich conversation so far, and I can see that we already have quite a few questions in our uh, Q&A uh, tab. If you have a, a question that you would like to ask and you haven't written it up yet, please feel free to click on the Q&A button and write your question. So, so far we have about four different questions. Uh, I think uh, it's already been touched on that the first one is about sustainability after a project, how to ensure that. So Tufa, I think I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to uh, think about an answer for that because ENACTS is one of the case studies is, that has had a real legacy and has managed to transcend just projects and, and carry on. And, and it would be nice to hear some thoughts from you about that. I know that our, our co-production manual does have a section on how to uh, ensure sustainability and scaling. So. Uh, once that is out, that we'll be able to share some lessons from that as well. But I think TUFA is probably best place to answer that today. Um, I'll just go through all the questions first and then come back to the answers from the different presenters, just so people have a sense of where we're going. Uh, the second question uh, was from Luke, and it was about um, the uh, project that they've been doing in Madagascar, uh, where TUFA has been involved. And so I think it's asking a little bit about how we could maybe um, improve monitoring uh, of um, the success of the projects and how we integrate feedback. They're just asking for some uh, feedback on, on how to best to do that and also asking a little bit about uh, whether there's any wiser support that could be offered. Uh, so as I say, the manual will be coming out in October uh, and we will hope that there would be some uh, useful resources for you there uh, in terms of what you might be able to do under the evaluation tab, um, under the evaluation building block. Um, but uh, I think if I can ask both Tufa and Catherine to respond to your question, please. Um, the next question is from Dorothy, who has asked us a very challenging one in terms of, is there any evidence that co-production is actually working? Um, are we seeing evidence that it is better than doing the, the usual process of production? Uh, so that one, I think I'd like to ask both um, uh, Anna, and uh, Emma to, to give some feedback on. And perhaps Joseph, if you want to give any, any thoughts on that one as well. I think you're probably the best free place for that. Uh, then we have a question from Chris Jack. Is there, are there any differences in key, key differences in the co-production processes of short versus um, multi-year uh, climate change timescales? I think that's a very good question, something that we've been definitely thinking about. Um, today's webinar covered both uh, kinds of co-production, so one's for weather or seasonal forecast and one for more longer term climate change like fractal uh, and AMA 2050. So I think there, there are um, some emerging differences. So can I ask um, Joseph and um, Catherine to give f first feedback on that one and then we'll, we'll see whether we can uh, get anyone else's opinions on that. Uh, there are two more questions, but I think that's probably enough to get us started with. Um, and then we can see how, how many more we can answer. So on the sustainability question, Tufa, over to you to please give some feedback from an act about your success in managing to create sustainability. Okay, uh, hi Luke. Uh, Luke is a friend of mine in Madagascar. See, and that also helps you make friends, that's one thing. Uh, so I think sustainability, the, a big challenge and the, the way we approach it in two ways uh, uh, from the INACTS perspective. The first thing is INACTS is not a project. We are not presenting INACTS. It's not as a, as a project. It's a process. So when we say uh, we implement INACTS in a country, we don't say we implemented INACTS in that country. We say we have started implementing INACTS in that country. So the inactus we have today is quite evolved from the inactus we had, I don't know, when we started in Ethiopia seven something years ago. So it has been evolving. So because it has been evolving, we keep going back to Ethiopia and we keep going back to 
Madagascar from different projects. That's one thing. The other thing is local ownership. So the, the main owner of INACT at national level is the national mail services. It is their job. For example, they have to do tasks every 10 days to update the data. And if, you do, if they don't do that, because we also link the national mail services with their users. So even if you keep quiet, the users wouldn't keep quiet. They will ask them, where is this information? Where is this data? Why is not the map room on what? And the other issue is actually in access is expensive. Is what makes it expensive is the fact that it is people from IRI going all over the place trying to implement it. And now through Wiser, we are trying to overcome that. What, what we've been trying to do is build the capacity in the region. So we've been working with ICPAC to build in capacity at ICPAC so that next time TUFA doesn't fly from New York to Nairobi to implement Iran. So that way it will be cheaper, it will be more sustainable. And we are planning or, or we have started the same process in agreement in West Africa. Uh, so that's about the sustainability issue. Uh, maybe I don't know if, if I can address the, a little bit the question about another example of the co-production. Can I uh, say something about that? Hello? Yes, please go ahead, Tufa. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I, I think another example of a very good co-production uh, process, uh, again, for INACTS, is uh, climate services for agriculture in Rwanda. So when we started INACTS, uh, in Rwanda, what, about four or something years ago. So we did the usual climate data, climate information, climate uh, services thing, and then at one point you stop. But then USAID funding came in. So actually, okay, let's take this information to the farmers. So that process started, the idea is actually to take climate information produced by the National Health Services through inter intermediaries to farmers at our farmer level. And that is done through, I think many of you are fam familiar with what is called PIXA, the participatory climate, what, climate information? Participatory climate from surface for agriculture, uh, which is led by uh, a team at the University of Reading in, in the UK. Made. So the, here, because of, so when that project started, they had to do, for example, graphs manually, and if they, if they don't have station data at a given location, then they cannot do it. But because now we have NX data, which is available every four kilometers across Rwanda, and because of that project, we created an, an online tool where any field agent or any extension worker from the field can click any location, and that creates automatically the graph they need for the training. And that expanded the tra training very fast across uh, Rwanda. And last year, actually, this project uh, was awarded, I think, the climate, the first climate smart agriculture, what? The first climate smart agriculture project of the year uh, in Africa uh, in 2018. Let me stop here. Thanks very much, Tufa. Would anyone else like to comment on sustainability issues of the, the panelists? You can just unmute yourself and, and reply. I can do, just give, um, this is Catherine, I can just give one, um, one example um, of ways of, of addressing the, the projectized nature and sustainability of this. I know participatory scenario planning, which is an approach um, some of you will probably be familiar with, which is to um, create advisories for different sectors based on seasonal forecasts, um, which has been developed by Care International. I know in Malawi there's been a lot of interest in, uh, in PSP and it was based on the interest and commitment of a number of different parties that, that brought the process to the country um, and has led to 
we can't yet say long-term sustainability, but uh, Dorothy, who asked one of the questions, has been uh, has been looking at the the history of PSP in Malawi, and certainly there has been some continuity from district to district, even after a project has ended, because the project has been successful in uh, first of all drumming up interest in the process, but also building the skills and capacity necessary for the process to, to take place. So um, that is one positive example of where there are some, um, some good indications of sustainability. Can I Thanks also, much, yes, carry on Anna. So it's, it's Anna Stainall here. Um, I think the, the, Definitely, there is a there is a move from the funding agencies towards understanding that project based short project based funding um, around co production isn't isn't as good as as looking at the longer term solutions. So I think there is a move from the funding agencies um, to start rethinking the way that they're funding these kinds of activities so that they're not just one off activities, um, but also. I think this highlights the the importance of not focusing solely on the product of co-production, but focusing um, also, or sometimes even more importantly, on the process of co-production. Um, because through the process, you're generating the networks um, amongst the practitioners and amongst the researchers that are sustainable beyond the project, that don't require the project funding to continue. Um, so if we if if I can just dip into the question around um, the, the the evidence of of products created through co-production being better than products just created by usual production, um, I think if we there there are evidence of products that are created through co-production and uh, Tufa highlighted some through the Enax project process, um, and we can highlight some through the Fractal project as well. Um, for instance, the um, climate change information has now been included into the Winter Climate Change Action Plan, um, and they're kind of tangible products of the fractal process that we can pick on. But more importantly, are the relationships and networks that have been built through the co-production process. And these relationships and networks are sustainable post any kind of funding activity, even after the project finishes, um, those relationships and networks have now been built and will hopefully be carried forward. But um, it's the capacity building, the awareness, the relationships that are built through the process that are almost the more important um, aspect of co-production that leads to sustainability and the, the more effective in integration of climate information into decision making. Um, Thanks Susanna. very much. Suzanne, yes. if I, it's uh, Emma here. I just wonder if I could, um, sorry, not of to course. go into too much of one question, um, but just building on what Anna just said, I think it's also in terms of this issue of sustainability, it's also really important to think about the capacities that you require for co-production, as Anna mentioned, and rather than focusing too much on perhaps intermediaries or knowledge brokers, I think there's perhaps growing interest in thinking about what, it, what are the capacities that you really need to undertake co-production and then where are those best strengthened and, and built? So for example, couldn't it, couldn't it be possible to really include risk communication capacities as one of the standard trainings uh, within meteorological training? Or I think what became very clear in the recent AMA 2050 end of project meeting was that early career research themselves really recognize the need to undertake co-production. They recognize the, the importance of it and they really are looking for support on how do you do it? What do I need to, to do it and what skills do I need? So I, I think, as I mentioned in the AMA 2050 presentation, really thinking about where we invest capacities um, in this kind of work to make sure that it's uh, developing institutional capacities rather than, um, than kind of intermediary bodies. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think I'm going to ask Joseph then if he can uh, give us a bit more uh, on the evidence that it works of from Scapia. I know you had some great stats in, in the presentation about a 400% increase in crop yield. So I think that is a, a really good <laughs> indication that something worked, but maybe you want to give a bit more information about it. Joseph, you can go ahead. OK. 
Okay, I'm not sure. There might be a problem there with Joseph's line. So let, let's then move on to the last question, which is about weather versus climate and whether there's differences in how we do co-production for those. Katinka, would you be able to give us some insights? Thanks for throwing that last minute to my <laughs> side, Suzanne. Um, so to CJ's question, Chris Jacks. Um, in my mind, but this is, uh, uh, I guess, my personal opinion is that it shouldn't really make a difference because in essence, it's about working together in a process and um, learning how to integrate the, the, the more scientific knowledge coming from universities and research institutions with the local knowledge. So whether that is um, thinking about long-term change or short-term change. Uh, it doesn't really make, make a difference. Um, it's more about learning together and enabling decision makers and scientists to, to make the right decisions with a, a wide range of um, knowledge inputs. But maybe Chris disagrees and would like to to make any any contrary statements. Uh, Chris, if you do have any follow-ups, you can put it into the chat, no problem. But unfortunately, today's webinar is not interactive with uh, being able to make um, verbal speeches. Uh, okay, then I'll go on to the next question that we had from Bettina, uh, which was about, is co-production a silver bullet to overcome all climate services challenges? Where do you see the limitations of the co-production approach? And I think we, we, in the manual, we definitely have touched on the fact that co-production might not be, uh, you know, the right approach for you in, in terms of what you want to do. And you need to think very carefully about whether it is the right approach um, and it certainly isn't um, to be interchanged with all climate services. I don't think we should see co-production and climate services as necessarily the same thing. Co-production is an approach that can help you build better climate services, but it's certainly not the be all and end all. Um, there, there are other valid processes along the way that need to you know, also be thought about. But we're, obviously our, our manual is focusing on co-production. Would any of the other presenters like to comment further on that one? Can I come back on uh, one of the earlier questions? Um, the Chris Jack's question about um, long-term versus short-term. And I mean, I, I agree with Katinka in terms of it's the similar kinds of steps in the process maybe and the principles underlying it. But some of the differences that we found in AMA, I think, um, and in other similar work um, is that in terms of longer term climate work, there, there is a difference in terms of um, this really requiring inputs from research institutions. That often uh, national MET services are obviously focused on meteorological timeframes, but when it comes to um, looking at longer term climate, those capacities might be situated, often are situated in research institutions um, that may or may not have formal links with the National Met Service. So I think that's, that is one difference, um, maybe different sets of actors, but also particularly in the provider side. And, of, and also the question around um, uncertainties, obviously the uncertainties going out um, get even more complicated. They're complicated enough even within short time frames, but in longer time frames, they're even more complicated. And it also gets very difficult to demonstrate um, immediate benefits because um, it's at such long time frames that we won't really know whether these uh, approaches are effective. So I think there are significant differences um, and it is worth bearing those in mind when undertaking co-production at different time frames. Right, thanks. So I can say something about the co, uh, uh, Bethany, uh, Bethany asked the question on uh, where do you see the limitation on the co-production? Thanks Tufa, uh, go ahead. Sorry? I said thanks Tufa, please go ahead. Okay. So I think uh, one big limitation is cost. Uh, Co-production is costly both in terms of resources, I mean, with material resources, human resources. It is a two-way or multi-way engagement. And as we said earlier, 
it is not that like one time engagement when you do something and you go away and you assume it will continue. So because of that, it is expensive. And I think uh, because of the quick return and the quick output that the funding agencies are looking for, uh, it's not e easy to get funding for such uh, a process. So I think for me, that is one big uh, challenge I see in, in co-production process. Thank you very much, Tufa. I think we've, we've only got a few minutes left to spare. Um, so I think I'm going to draw the, the chat to a close now and um, ask the, uh, the rest of the questions that have been submitted, we will answer uh, virtually um, and give you an email reply. But uh, thank you very much for your very insightful and useful questions. I think that's, there's clearly a lot of interest and, and discussion going on about co-production. Um, there's just a few thank yous to make. So thank you to the, the panel for all making yourselves available to share with us today the really interesting learnings from WISER and from uh, FCFA on different co-production projects. I think we can see from all of those projects that, that there's a very wide range of different ways to go about it. And that, uh, you know, there's, as they said, no one size fits all. We've got to think about the context. We've got to really alter the process as we, as we approach things because it's not just a, a formulaic system. The building blocks are there, but you don't need to necessarily use all of them. And, uh, you know, I hope that the, the, the learnings from today's webinar uh, resonate with, with you. Please let me know if you, uh, you can send me an email if you have any further comments or thoughts. Um, I will be giving further information about the manual, um, which at the moment has 18 case studies. We do have a small amount of uh, leeway to add a few extra case studies. Some of the wiser phase two projects will still be added to this co-production manual. Uh, but the first uh, draft version will be uh, available um, in October, it will be re uh, released at the African Climate Risk Conference. So please do look out for that. Um, I wanted to also say thank you to all the attendees for, for your time. Um, we've had a, a, at least 40 attendees over the course of the webinar, and it's been great to get your participation uh, and uh, um, your, your questions. I'm going to launch a poll now, uh, just to in terms of whether you found this uh, webinar to be helpful. If you can give us some feedback, we'd really appreciate you taking the two, two minutes to answer the poll that's on your screen right now and while you're answering that just to say that then that we um, will be having further wiser webinars uh, and we will continue the the topic of co-production looking at the principles next time uh, we don't have a date yet for that next webinar but we will be in communication with you when it's finalized and if you have any further suggestions of other topics about co-production or other things that are related to WISER that you would like to hear more about, um, then please let us know. Uh, we know that the sustainability issue is one that we think that the WISER program as a whole might be able to give some more, some more input on. And so that's definitely in my thinking process to potentially host another webinar on how we can ensure sustainability of uh, these types of processes. So if you have any other thoughts or ideas, please feel free to drop me an email. Okay, the poll has another minute to go. So um, wishing you all a very good day further and thank you so much for your time and attendance.